Are we live? All right, there we go. Listen to some The Sword. That song was called March of the Lore. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. The Sword, uh, what album is that from? Winter, uh, man, what album is that from? The Sword. And the sword, they uh, that is an album, Age of Winters from the Sword. Oh man, those guys crush! The Sword went on to become a uh, a little bit more like Southern rock kind of. It's actually interesting. So you know, people change their they change, man. They get older, they they see things different, and they want to freelance in different areas. It sucks because uh, their version of Southern Rock didn't quite do it for me, given how hard the sword was. But my goodness. Hi, right, Steve. Joe was first. Joe was first. There's Marie. Happy Tuesday. Right on. Happy Tuesday. Yeah, right on. Look, Steve. Look at Vaughn. No, no, no. Vaughn. You guys. Joe was first because last night, Joe had to go see a movie. Hey, Glenda Pitcher. Never seen Glenda Pitcher around. Welcome, Glenda. And look at all you guys trying to take credit for what you're not, dudes. That's the wrong answer. All right, so next week, Terry Greer. All right, some new guys here. All right, cool. Terry, Glenda, no one on Facebook yet? Nope. I wouldn't expect anyone on Facebook, but every now and again, some folks on there. It's all good. Anyone on Rumble yet? Let's see here. Yo, yo, ma. Next week, we're going to have a fun one. Uh, Craig Israelson is coming back. Um and he is going to, if I can find, I don't have my specs. Okay, if we can find uh, Chicken Charlie. All right. You just learned about me. How'd you learn about me, Glenda? Um, I'm glad to hear that. Mike Winaz, right on. Cool. Bruce in the house. Marie. Um, do my kids don't have them numbered? Yeah. How are you doing? I call them uh, thing one, thing two, three, thing three, thing four. So uh, actually I actually called, uh, I was telling Calvin earlier today, I said, man, you know your middle name was actually Amazon? And I uh, said, because you're uh, you're the son of the Amazon guy. <laughs> and he just said, uh, through a retired Facebook page. Cool. All right, sweet. I'm not even on Facebook. I mean, I have a page there, but I don't do anything. So I said to Kevin, your name's Amazon. <laughs> He's like, yeah, whatever, Dad. Good times, Dad. Good times. So Craig Israelson will be joining us next week at the uh, man, dude. I just had some ribeye. Uh, next Tuesday, uh, next uh, Tuesday the sixteenth. Excuse me, Tuesday sixteenth at eight p.m. Eastern time, and we're gonna. Uh, we're gonna. He's gonna go over some of his findings about. Um, what the hell did he say here? He had a good title for our. Uh, I can't remember. He's gonna go over some of his findings on his research on investments, and I can't remember. I, he has a good title in there. But anyway, uh, so Craig, uh, you know, he's a the professor of investments at Utah Valley State, I guess, a university, some of that. Who's the author of the 712 portfolio, and he's got a slide deck he wants to show everybody, um, and a spreadsheet stuff that you can actually get from him if you want. So that's gonna be a good time. Good time. Uh, well, hey, there's Carson in the house. Right on, Carson. Good to see you here. Right on, right on. So he will be joining us. All right. So before we dump into that, I wanted to uh, do part two of these are the people managing our money because um, it's just. Do I ever talk to people on the phone? Yeah, I have a uh, a fee page on my website, Glenda, at heritagewealthplanning.com. I do Zoom calls primarily, um, Zoom meetings. But uh, uh, it's not just one-off questions. Like I got to do elaborate financial planning and retirement planning. And when I say elaborate, that doesn't mean it's time-consuming. Because a lot of people think, you got to spend 10 hours. No, 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 no. When you're experienced as I am, you don't need 10 hours. I'm just telling you right now, it's, it's insane what these guys do, man. Um, these guys will spend just hours upon hours. And I just, it's, it's dumb, Frank. It's a waste of time. Keep it simple, stupid, my friends. 
I, I've actually come to the conclusion big time, not on my own. There's a guy named Matt uh, McKinley, McKinley from Quantum of Conscious YouTube channel. I enjoy immensely. And uh, he's out of Philadelphia. See, Morristown or Fort Washington or something like that. I can't remember. But anyway, he, um, he says uh, the world is set up to make us more confused because more confused world makes us more um, not able to focus, less able to do what the creator wants us to do, more noise. And I completely agree. We've got to get back to a keep it simple, stupid mentality. Um, all this, you know, all this stuff, everything is confusing. You know, you got to call to get your, you bounce a check and you got to call your bank. You know, eight different languages on there. You know, press zero and you're like, it's an AI and you're like, I just want to talk to somebody. You know what I'm saying? All this is to get us confused. Um, oh, thanks, Rebecca. Oh, look at Rebecca crushing it. Zoom calls are awesome. Gives peace of great. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. You crush. Rebecca's my sister, by the way. Um, I'm joking. She's not. But um, the issue is that we, uh, we, we've had that... Um, we, we, we've gone away from kiss and we've gone to complexity and that, that just takes us away from our, Oh, Jeremy's here. Okay. Everybody bow down. Jeremy Maine's here. Oh, Hey, we got a love on. Hey, Tony balanced it. All right. Cool. On Facebook. Wow. Maybe Tuesday's a different crew here. Well, fantastic. Um, and we got to get back to the creator. Uh, in fact, let's say prayers. My hair's a mess. Sorry. Heavenly father, we just thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your guidance in all we do. We ask for forgiveness for our many sins, many sins that we commit against you, even though in your good book you tell us exactly the rules of the world and that we we fall short. Thankfully, you sent Jesus here, the only perfect one, in order to open the gates of heaven for us to be near you in eternity. For those who follow your direction, and when we fall short, to seek forgiveness. And Lord, we just pray for peace of mind, for simplicity in our lives, to hear through the noise and reconnect with you in the quiet and tranquility of all that you can do and have done for your world and your people whom you love, who you desire to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us, individuals unique created in your image. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um. Yeah, I, mean, I was out in the garden. Anyway, the point being is that um, I do think they, uh, I was at Fort Hall. What are you doing in Florida, Jeremy? Think about moving, brother? I was, um, the, the issue is uh, simplicity is divine. Uh, 100%. Simplicity is divine. Uh, complexity is satanic. We got to get back to that mode. 100%. And so the more we can focus on the simple, peace of mind will come. Actually, I was listening to Warren Buffett. I, I just read this today. Um, I knew he was a, a junkie in terms of fast food. He likes McDonald's or Dairy Queen or something like that. He drinks five cup. He drinks five cokes a day and eats McDonald's every morning, something like that. And he said, "I'm not a big fan of Warren Buffett. I just, I, I, there's, I don't know, whatever." But he said something I thought was intriguing. He goes, "Man, when you're content, you know, you're happy. You're gonna have a longer life when you're happy. And happy is contentment." And I completely, completely agree with that contentment is going to be longevity. So Warren Buffett said, yeah, I drink Cokes. I eat crap. Here I am kicking in 91. Charlie Munger is 99. We're content. We're happy. It must be nice to have so much money. How many rich people are killing themselves? Because they're not content. They're not happy. Contentment, man. Contentment. Strive for it. Seek it. Contentment. I was telling Charlotte today, so man, I don't really do much, you know, I, had a, 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 yeah, I basically have one meeting a day, essentially. Sometimes I have two um, and, uh, and I, you know, I go out in the garden, walk the dogs, do a couple of videos, read a lot, you know what I'm saying? And I, I tell you, I want to see if they, Kroger going on Tuesday seems to be the best time to get some meat on sale at Kroger. You can get some good deals. They didn't have anything today for beef. Um, they had, you know, some chicken on sale. I, I, I don't, I didn't want a chicken necessarily. I got enough chicken, but and anyway, long story short, I was like, um, I told my wife, I said, I don't really even, like, she was, you know, I think I was going to Kroger in Alpharetta. I said, no, I'm going to Kroger at nine. I try to avoid Windward Parkway as much as I possibly can. I like to be content. Just keep it simple, man. Keep it simple. Um, anyway, the, the issue is, I, I, I just, for me, I need it, man. I need it. Contentment. Contentment. All right. Um, today's retirement day number two. Not missing waking up to a pre-dawn alarm yet. Ooh, no way, dude. 
And I saw Marie said, Man, Tim's been around for a long time. When I used to wear a suit on, on his channel. I started my channel in April, May, March of 2018. So this is year we're into 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We're into year six. Isn't that crazy? And now you're lucky I even got pants on. Do you even know if I have pants on? I might not. Marie says, can you retire if you have a million bucks? That question that other financial YouTubers ask. <laughs> crazy. Crazy. All right. So I want to first we want to show you this real quick. Mm -hmm. Don't get it. One second. This actually bothered me quite a bit. Um, no more alarms, Denise. Right on. Right on, Marie. Right on. So this is from boxday.net. And uh, he does cartoons, which is pretty cool. I, you know, I don't, and I, I can't read that right there. How dare I read that? Um, but a professor out of Tokyo has come up with the idea that uh, the SV40 sequence is promoter of cancer viruses. And that's for some reason is in something that should not be named. I'm not going to say anything more. All right. So let's keep. I uh, wanted to go down here. Hold on just a second. The economy of evil. Uh, this actually bothers me. I, uh, big time. All right, so so I did my earlier video today on these people manage our money, talk about the Federal Reserve people and the econometrics and just the insanity of economics as a whole. They act like they're all that in a bag of chips and they don't know they're freaking way out of the hole in the ground. All right, so but this is where it gets evil. That that's just dumb. This is just evil. It was completely obvious that something was merely a glimpse of the tip of the iceberg. And that the liberal world order rests upon an evil economy of abuse, blackmail. I can't say a couple of these things and worse. And we're going to go to this uh, from Zero Hedge. In 2014, current CIA director William Burns had three meetings with Jeffrey Epstein when Burns was Obama's Decretary, deputy secretary of state. So we've heard this now that William Burns is a scumbag and I'll probably get arrested now because they'll put stuff on me that I never did. But it is what it is. And if they want you bad enough, they're going to convict you of uh, child stuff. I mean, it's just it, it's no getting around. They want you, they're going to get you, and you'll have no, no one's going to say, oh, you know, he was innocent. Everyone's guilty because everyone believes the authority, and that's what it is. At this stage, I think if anyone's being charged with the easiest one is child stuff, you have to say it's all planned. I really got to believe that now um, because it's, they can do whatever they want, and there's no one to be held accountable. No one cares um, as long as the agenda gets moved forward. It's just a fact. And there's nothing you can do about it. They can easily, and look, this is one of the reasons these black guys in urban areas were so anti-cop, because, they, man, they planted stuff on us, dude. And if you say, no, they didn't, you, who's going to believe you? You know what I'm saying? You're just some poor black kid, you know, probably got a little bit of a criminal history, and you're saying, I never do that. Oh, yeah, right, they're a guy. The cops will never do wrong, you know what I'm saying? And now we got prosecutors. It's, I mean, it's... And you're always going to be on the short end of the stick because authority always wins. The Republicans love prosecution. Oh, they're prosecutor. They got to be legit. You know what I'm saying? And Democrats love it too. They do. They all love prosecution. Everyone wants to be on the other side of prosecuting people. Very few people want to be on the defense because the defense is where you got to defend somebody against accusations of doing bad things, even if it's planted. And we just, this is the way it is, man. There's no other way around it. And there's, I mean, if, if you don't believe that anymore, just look what happened to January 6th people. The the authority is not on our side. It's just not. You know, that doesn't mean you go rebel and riot and all that stupid. You just say, okay, I'm going to just try to make do what I can do right here in my little neck of the woods. But the idea that the authority is your friend is nuts. And Republicans need to learn this, but they won't because they're too busy in the uh, false dichotomy of, you know, we got to get Putin before he gets us. Or we got to get China before they get us. And uh, it's sad because we're losing right here already without our enemy armies on the ground. All right. So Epstein, Epstein we know what happened. So this is after the, CIA, the current head of the CIA met with Epstein after he had been convicted of that. Burns and Epstein first met in Washington prior to Burns uh, visiting Epstein as Manhattan townhouse. Okay. Um, Mr. Burns, a career diplomat and former ambassador to Russia, had meetings with Epstein in 2014 when he was Secretary of State. Um, he had a lunch plan at the office of law firm Steptoe & Johnson in D.C. He scheduled two evening appointments with Mr. Burns, and this is not Montgomery Burns, you know, our favorite lovable you know, evil guy, nuclear uh, power plant. This is the real evil guy, the CIA director. After one of the scheduled meetings, Epstein planned for his driver to take Mr. Burns to the airport. 
But check this out. One month after meeting with us, Epstein, Burns stepped down from his role in the State Department to serve as president of the Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a think tank he ran from 2014 to 2021 when he became Sniffy Joe's CIA director. Now, here's where it gets even evil. So, look, the CIA can't be trusted. I mean, the FBI can't be trusted. None of these guys can. Doesn't mean you go right. It just says, look, they're not our friends. You know, do what you can to walk the straight and narrow and just let the chips fall that they But to think that the FBI is on it, they're going to get to the bottom of this. Or the DOJ, you're freaking nuts. Here's where it gets ugly. Epstein also had dozens of meetings with then Obama White House attorney Catherine Rumler. Sounds Nazi ish. Rumler, you know, was it him? Who's the guy? Uh, no, it wasn't Himmler, the, the guy who was not a Nazi, but he was the uh, the Desert Fox. What was that guy's name? You all remember him, the Desert Fox. That guy kicked ass. He wasn't a Nazi. Uh, Himmler wasn't him, wasn't him. Anyway, so Epstein also met with uh, Catherine Himmler, who went on to become Goldman Sachs's top lawyer in 2020. Epstein had planned for her to join him on a 2015 trip to Paris and then to visit his private island in the Caribbean. Catherine Himmler had dozens of meetings with Epstein in the years after her White House service and before she became a top lawyer at Goldman Sachs. Within weeks of Himmler's, I'm yes, her name's not Himmler, but to me, she's a Nazi. Uh, we'll just use that. Within weeks of Himmler's 2014 from the Obama White House, Epstein planned a lunch at his townhouse, followed by a series of meetings to introduce her to his acquaintances. The two first met at when Epstein called her to ask if she'd be interested in representing uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. And Melinda Gates, you'll always be tarnished with your husband, Bill. And you know you're up to no good, too, Melinda. Don't just try to push it off on Bill because he knew Jeffrey Epstein. You you, you freaking took the ticket, too, Melinda, you clown, scumbag. Melinda's like, I'm just an innocent wife. No, you're not. You're not. You're just as evil as all these people. Uh, so check this out. So the two met when Epstein called her to ask if she'd be interested in representing the evil people, Bill and Melinda. Uh, Epstein also connected him with Ar Ariane de Rothschild. What? Current CEO of the Swiss private bank de Rothschild Group. Himmler's law firm was hired by the bank to help them with regulatory U.S. matters. Yep, 100%. Every single member of the international elite is a part of this wicked system to a greater or lesser extent. Every politician, every high-level bureaucrat, every celebrity, and every corporate executive. Those who refuse to take the ticket are automatically sidelined with obstacles systematically placed in their pathway. Forget Marxism, forget capitalism, forget every secular attempt to explain what cannot be explained by purely materialist paradigms. This is the way the world works. 100%. Forget Marxism, forget capitalism, forget every secular attempt, attempt to explain the world away. These ticket traders trade in information, flesh, and souls. The liberal world order is a rules-based regime in which the devil sets the rules and are enforced by demons, which is why both the Christians in Russia and secularists in China are determined to see it destroyed. And frankly, Christians, hopefully in the United States too, and Muslims, and Jews, and atheists. I don't know how you can be an atheist anymore, but whatever. In an inverted world, freedom is slavery and success is damnation. But I just want to read this out again. The liberal world order is a rules-based regime in which the devil sets the rules that are enforced by demons. I cannot, that is, man, it, one freaking hundred percent. Rommel, that was right, Jeremy, Rommel. Yeah, the Desert Fox, Rommel crushed. One hundred percent. And, uh, you know, people can see it or not. I don't care. You know, people say, oh, man, we got to get them over there before they get us over here. If you still follow that's fine. I don't fall for it anymore. I'm over it. Um, the idea that we're the good guys, all the other guys are the bad guys. Um, but it's it's 100 percent, man. We are run by a, a, an evil entity that's not capitalistic. It's not Marxist. It's not socialist. It's evil, dude. And I, you know, I think about it all the time, am I participating in evil? And I, the answer is yes, to some degree, I guess. And, you know, what it, but, you know, what, the, the best way to do it is not to only be a little bit evil, it's just to recognize that, you know, you don't make the rules, you just play by them. Like I was talking to this guy today, you know, he's, he's got a couple million bucks, he's going to qualify for Obamacare subsidies. 
and was like, dude, we didn't make the rules, man. We're just playing by it. You know, so the rules were enforced on us. So we're going to use the rules to our, uh, right here. We're going to use the rules to our, our benefit for sure. But don't get snared into the rules. Like, and I was actually listening to, um, uh, who was it? He was, I, I can't remember. My man, my man, Robert Barnes. I couldn't believe it. He was bashing on Owen Benjamin. And I said, the only reason you're doing that is because you're auditioning for Joe Rogan. That's obviously why. And I just, and Joe Rogan, you know, he's, he's one of these, you know, demons, you know, they sold their soul, man. They sold their soul for good time rock and roll. And I just, uh, sad. It's sad. And there's nothing to do about it other than call it out when you see it. you got to call out evil when it exposes itself. And if Jeffrey Epstein is running around with Obama, the Obama's chief lawyer, who is now the chief lawyer for Goldman Sachs, I mean, it's just these are the people involved in the uh, Ariane de Rothschild. You know, it's running. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. These people run the show. And, you know, people can deny it all they want. They can say, oh, no, no, dude, that's that, whatever. They're wrong. They're wrong. Um, yeah, what I'm saying, man. God has given the devil the reign of the world until Christ's return. Be not this world, children. What I'm saying, man. Torver is, ooh, I'm going, I ain't going for Toronto. I would like to see Toronto win a cup. I'm not going to lie. After the Bruins beat them. When we were down four nothing in the third period in Game Seven in 2000, and was that 2011, 13? I can't remember. And we came back and won the cup. Um, I think it was the same year. I, I, I would actually like to see the Maple Police win. I think that'd be kind of cool. All right, so that's just what I have to say. Um, you know, if you guys follow that link I put on you, you know, my man Vox will say some things that are controversial and be offensive. Okay. Yeah, wake up. It's okay to be controversial and offensive. All right. So let me show you one of the things I'm working on here. Um, if I can get this up, I um, might not be able to on this screen. I ah, shoot. So I, uh, I probably won't be able to do it here. Oh, man. Oh, man. I got my other screen. Ah, dag nabbit. Um, So I've been working on modeling dividends on. So I did a video a couple weeks back about VDIGX, the Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund. And I can't remember what I said in that video, but I remember I had a couple of girls like, eh, that, you know, that fund sucks. It actually is a five-star world-class fund. It doesn't suck. And I and people are like, you should use, what do they say, v, VIG, I can't remember what it is. So some funds, I said that they haven't been around long enough. Dude. We don't have enough track. We've been around. Remember, ETFs, there is no ETFs, essentially. I mean, really, I know State Street in 1993. The vast, vast, vast majority of ETFs didn't really kick in until the early aughts. And there was no bond ETFs until about, what, 2008, 9, 10? So we didn't have a lot of ETFs like we have now. So we don't have enough track record to see how they performed uh, previous to the uh, the middle of the aughts. We just don't. Um, anyway, so the, the issue is that we, we have we, – we, <laughs> We have to use funds that have been around for some time, and, and those are going to be probably, in fact, of all mutual funds. All right, so the, the longest mutual fund that's an index fund, a dividend oriented, is a Vanguard Value Index Fund. My premise here is that, oh man, I don't have my stuff up here. I wish I had on the other channel, on the other um, screen I got. Ah, shoot. My premise is that at the end of the day, people have this infatuation and okay with dividends as if dividends are the cat's meow. And I like dividends. I mean, don't get me wrong. All my stocks I own are all dividend payers. But they think they're going to have this growing dividends that, that don't stop. And, and I just, that's just not true, man. Um, and I, I, and I, I can't believe people still think this. Like, so remember, bank stocks pays a lot of dividends, and bank stocks in 2007 and 8 they had to stop their dividends. They, they paid one penny. Many bank stocks. Why do they only pay a penny? Because it to, for the preferred stockholders, the basically is a dividend to receive the dividend on preferred stocks. The bank had to p continue to pay the regular dividends, and so they made the revenue, regu regular dividends one penny. But if you own a bank stock back then, and you're used to getting a four or five percent yield. Um, now you're getting one penny. You're not get, you're not basically not making any dividends anymore, and it stayed like that for a while. How soon? How quickly people forget? Now the preferred stocks did fine. I mean, in terms of the dividend, they got crushed. Preferred stocks were down forty five percent in two thousand eight, but they did get their pay. They got their dividends, and all was you know made well. I mean, eight nine years later, something like that. 
But if you're in a bank stock thinking, you know, the growing dividends, that didn't happen. Anyway, so I want to just kind of back test. And um, and I don't want to back. See, this is the issue. We got to we want to back test solely dividend holdings. We, we don't want with like uh, some of these funds are um, the Wellington is a perfect example. Fidelity Balance is another one. These are income funds, so, you know, dividends and bond. And, and I'm not doing dividends and bonds. I just want to do the holdings on um, uh, on dividends to show you that dividends don't always grow. And when you're pulling money out of portfolio and the dividends are not only gro not growing, but they're going down, that, that's a problem. That's a problem. Don't forget next uh, Tuesday, two Tuesdays from today, my man Craig Israelson, will sh uh, again, you know, the Ph.D. professor guy over at Utah, Utah State Valley University or something like that. Uh, we're going to do a, a session um, live um, where he's going to go over some of his slides on you know, spreadsheets that he has, so which looks pretty cool. So I'm very much, uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. Anyway, so let's go. I'm going to back test. So we're going to just we're going to start with the Vanguard Value uh, Value Index, Large Cap Value Index. All right, we're going to put 100 percent in. All right, and we're going to do we're going to reinvest dividends. All right. We're going to reinvest it. So we're going to hit this. And it's the, the inception was 1993. All right. So reinvesting dividends. And we grew from 10,000 to 150,000 in 30 years. All right. So we'll take that. Compounded annual growth rate is 9.36%. You can't shake a stick at that. dude. So if we take the rule of 72, we got we take 72, oops, 72 divided by 9.36. That means we doubled our money every 7.7 .7 years. Not too shabby, if you ask me. And that's without contributing anything. It's just basically 10,000 bucks. But I mean, how many of us had 10,000 bucks in 1992? Well, in 1992, I was freaking 22 years old. You see what I'm saying? What was that time called in the odds? The great dividend something? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, man. What was that time called in the odds? The great dividend? Yeah, everyone's a fan of SCHD, but it wasn't it hasn't been around long enough. That's that's the issue. Everyone's like, oh, the, so when I did my video, it was like, ah, the Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund sucks. You should use SCHD or I think it was VIG. I can't remember. I was like, they weren't, they didn't have this. They're not around long enough. They're, they didn't. They they were incepted in nineteen two thousand seven or even two thousand nine. We don't have the track record to see how it did, and I can't believe people don't recognize. It's crazy. I mean, I'm like, dude, you recognize. A lot of these things were accepted after they gave it a name when dividends tanked. The Great Recession, is that we're talking about? The financial, uh, global financial crisis, GFC. The global financial crisis, Andrew. And, and look, this isn't to say SCHD is bad. I'm just saying when people freaking snipe at me with stupid stupidity, I'm like, dude, you can't, you, you can't say SCHD is better than VDIGX. Just because VGIGX had a, had years where it had bad dividend growth, as SCAG would D will too, but it wasn't around to do that. Anyway, so let's look at this guy. I don't. People get real attached. It's weird to me. I'm like, okay, all right. So look, again, so we're gonna write this down. So we we ended it with 150,000 schmackaroonies, um, is what this says. All right. So we went start with 10,000. We end up with 150,000. All right. So we're gonna show you the income. Now, here's the ink. Oh, that's returns. Here's the income. Huh. Up. See, I hope I hope this makes sense, man. Now, this is capital gains and dividends. So we're going to large capital gain right here, obviously. But we'll, we'll go into it here in just a second. So this is capital gains and dividends. Now, this is an index fund. We can actually model it with capital gains if we want we, you know, in terms of what they paid in capital gains. I'm not going to do that here, but you can do that. But anyway, you can see right here. So it went up and went up and went up and then kablink, kablank, kaplunk. Whoa, whoa, what the hell happened? So here in 2002, it paid $515 of income on a portfolio that was worth, uh, right here, 2002, a portfolio that was worth 24,000 bucks. So the Vanguard Value Index paid $500 of income on a portfolio that's worth 24,000 bucks. Uh, which means you had a, a yield of 2%, 2%. So you're just going to live, and that's with capital gains in there. There probably isn't any capital gains here. 
huh? That's off 2000 a year before in 2001 when the portfolio was worth 30,000 bucks. So 2000 divided by 30,000 schmackaroonies. That's 2000. Yeah, right there. Divided by 30,000 schmackaroonies. That's a 6.6%. It's not a dividend yield that's going to have capital gains in there as well, but still a 6.6% income distribution that you're getting in 2001. Now, again, a lot, some of this can be attributed to capital gains. I, I get you, but still, uh huh. And then it didn't get back to here until right there, 2017. Growing dividends, I mean, then it fell again here. Growing dividends, schmoing dividends, crazy. All right, so now let's not reinvest the dividends. All right, so we're going to come back down here. We're going to remember we had uh, $3,000 of income in 1999, and we went down to five fifteen in 2002. All right, so now let's not reinvest dividends. All right, let's see what we got now. Boink. And now our 10,000 schmack runes is only worth 53,000 bucks. All right, so 10,000 went to 53. Compounded annual growth rate, 5.67. All right, so well, we still did okay. We doubled our money. We take 72, divide by 5.67. That's how we figure out our rule of 72. That means we doubled our money every 12 and a half, basically 12 and a half years. So we went from doubling our money every seven and a half years to doubling our money every 12 and a half because we weren't reinvesting the dividends. All right, but we still did okay. And we still quintupled our, quintupled, whatever it is, our initial deposit, you know, so we got 53,000 schmackers. All right, so now let's see. Oh, here's that income again, 2250. I can't remember. Here was 515. Look at that. So basically you can see right here, uh, 800 bucks was from capital gains, 200 bucks was from capital gains here. So we, so basically $200 was a capital gains before. Uh, now it's 300 bucks of income. Uh, simply what that means is capital gains in these couple of years at least ref, uh, represented quite a big amount of money um, that was uh, was attributed to relative to dividends. I, I don't know the exact numbers. I haven't looked up. It doesn't matter in this case. But anyway, again, we're not reinvesting our dividends. We're taking the income. All dividends and distributions were withdrawn. Uh, I mean, huh? and I and I, I don't have my spread. I can't show you my spreadsheet here. I wish I did because I'm working on this. I'm modeling it. I wonder if I actually can. Hold on a second. Let me stop sharing for a second. Let's see if I can't bring it up here. It's Edmund Fitzgerald. You know, didn't that guy Gordon Lightfoot die or something like that? Did I hear that? I like Gordon Lightfoot. I like that song. I like sundown. Wait, what does it say? Sundown, something, something. If you don't see me creeping around you, sundown, something, something. If I see you walking around, you're creeping around. That's a pretty good song. All right, so ooh, can I show you this? Yay. Look at Josh. Look at Josh under pressure, not folding like a cheap suit, still bringing the freaking yeah yeah look at that still bringing it to the the people still bringing it to the people no cheap so suit folding here like jeremy up in maine jeremy says panzer 3l long barrel is my favorite tanker world war ii is used a lot in north african campaign yeah yeah erwin rommel kicked ass dude big fan big fan of that guy um oh that means you support the nazis he was a nazi idiot Rommel is just a freaking German patriot. It's like saying uh, what uh, you know these Southern guys who had to be drafted for freaking the uh, the Confederacy. They supported slavery. Hey, freaking, I hate that. I I so sick of people like uh, you know you supported slavery because you're drafted in the Confederate Army, or hell, you could support slavery because you're drafted in the American Army. They're still slaves when America fought. Anyway. Yeah, right there. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, don't creep around when he's banging his wife. Exactly. Sundown, you better take care. If I see you creeping around my back stairs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was talking to, so my man Joseph here says, 
Uh, I want to use my dividends pay for Medicare Part D and Medigap. What I'm saying is this a good idea? Um, yeah. Um, so I was talking to a lady today, and she's, you know, we she even put her, her pension in the software. I said, lady, come on, sister. She's only two fifty a month. I said, that's basically your Medicare B and D premiums right there. Not, you know, obviously the Medicare B and D premium is going to grow. Her pension won't. But I said, man, I'll I'll take that. I'll go that. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I get you, Richard. Richard said, avoid the mutual fund EFT fee. I mean, we're talking a couple basis points, though. The fees isn't any big deal. I, the days of high fees on on mutual funds, at least an index, they're gone. They're just um, six, six bips. That's all we're talking about. Yep, exactly, Andrew. Rommel is suicide by Hillary because implicated one hundred percent. But if you say anything good about him, you're a Nazi. I just so sick of that crap, dude. It's like everything is so stupid. All right, anyway, let's. Uh, but I hear what you're saying, Richard. I mean, I I don't right now. All my all my stocks are individual right now. I don't own. Uh, well, I own a little bit of BTI, but everything I own is individual right now. I, I, I would go back to buying a dividend thing. Um, but yeah, dude, you know, I, look, I, I like dividends. I'm a dividend investor, 100%. I don't like the idea that dividends, I'm going to share with you even more here in just a second. All right, hold on. Let me, I'm getting off the track. Because freaking uh, someone's telling me to sing Gordon. Michael Hill wanted me to sing my version of Gordon Lightfoot. Sundown, you better get out of here. If I see you creeping around my back stairs. All right, so um, what was I doing here? All right, so here's, oh yeah, right here. So here's the average returns, the S&P 500, just what I'm thinking, I got to get my history. 1871, uh, the average return is 6.95. We had deflation during that time, so the net of inflation is 8.4. All right, so then we go back to here, 1991 to 2020, the average return is 10.7. We have inflation at 2.31, net of inflation is 8.4. How ironic, is that not? So the worst de uh, th three decades, four score and seven years ago, um, our forefathers, you all know his forefathers. Everybody knows his forefathers. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. No, Lincoln never said forefathers in this modern era. He said fathers. No one said, we all know his forefathers. That's Mandela effect. They're changing what Lincoln said. How dare you do? Oh, so Denise is retired now. She gets to talk smack. Now she's safe retired. Uh, weak, Denise. Weak. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers went in the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now that was, I just rhymed off the top of my head. I should have been a rapper. All right, anyway, I just want to point this out that, look, 1871 to 1900 sucked. Oh, uh, factor inflation actually did better. No, but that's not what we want to do. So we're, we're going to have VVAX here. So. Do I got my chart I created? I hope. Where is she? Where I'll make it bigger in just a second. I hope, ah, right there. Sweet. Yay. Yay for Josh. All right. Cool. All right. It's bigger. All right. Oops. There we go. All right. So here's my uh, my chart. And this. So just as a side note, my next course is, and I, I've said this. I'm going to keep saying it. Is going to be Investing Basics 101, How to Survive, and I don't know how I'm going to title this yet because it's too long of a title, How to Survive uh, 1927 through 1937, uh, 1966 through 1982 uh, in the aughts. And, and I don't have an answer for these yet. I'm working on it. You know what I'm saying? And my premise, my hypothesis is that uh, the dividends are the only thing that kept up with inflation a during those times right um and that dividends on top of that during deflationary times are wonderful i mean for for sure so if we go to japan like economy or a, a depressionary economy dividends are freaking great dude. there's no other way around that in fact i'm reading this article right here um about my man ed mcquarrie who apparently is on both heads a lot who talks a lot about the same thing on dividends um, oh man, it doesn't highlight my stuff. Oh man, I print this off, but didn't print off the highlights. Oh, I'm just gonna highlight it again. But anyway, his his uh, premise is that a lot of times dividends, uh, up until basically 1948, after World War One, dividends were reflected the only growth you got in the market, stock market. There's no growth of capital gains or i.e. appreciation. It's all in dividends. It's actually pretty interesting. 
And then from basically <clears throat> 1948 to 1968, bond market got crushed. Well, the stock market went gangbusters. So his premise at and Macquarie is that you take away that 20 year time frame, stocks and bonds are, are basically brothers, man, brothers in crime. You know what I'm saying? There's not a whole lot of difference between the two. And I actually find that interesting because same thing with small cap value. A lot of people say, well, small cap value stocks outperform. I, what's that guy's name? Paul Merriman. Crazy me. He's like, small cap value, small cap value. I'm like, dude, you take away 1975 to 1982, small cap values actually did worse than everything else. You, you just have these tiny little time frames in here and you take them away. They're not any better or any worse necessarily. It's just if you miss those time frames, what you did, you're not going to you're going to be disappointed. And um, and so the stocks versus bonds argument, you take away that 20 year time frame after World War II until about 1968. They're, they're basically, again, they're the same, roughly. And this is going back centuries. It's crazy. I didn't know that. And I read this paper before. It just it never it didn't kick into me until I read it again. Sometimes you got to read twice. At least your old buddy, Josh. I don't pick up a lot of times the first time. Anyway, so so the premise is that the dividends. Not only do they give you the only growth in the stocks, uh, you know, before the old days, um, but during deflation, they that's it, man. D you know, dividends are wonderful because dividends are a cash account and cash is always king during deflationary times. So, again, my premise is that the dividends will be your best bet, but that doesn't mean they're going to have unencumbered success. On, I'm getting growth every single year in dividends. All right. So let's go back to this guy. All right, so here we got the dividend versus yield. So we got the date going back to the inception, 1993. This is the yield in red, all right? So the yield is on this side right here. So you can see you've got 3% yield right here. And right here, the yield spiked up to over 4%. All right, so here's the price. You can see it's down 20, up to 40, up to 60, and down about 55. Here's the yield bouncing around. Three over four and back to two. So we can see the dividend yield for Vanguard uh, value index has been about two, two and a half, uh, other than this time right here in 1995 and this time right here in 2010. That's actually 2008. So here's the question Why did that spike in dividend yield? There's an easy answer for this. Why the spike in that dividend yield for the Vanguard value fund? I, I hope you guys can see what I'm pointing at here. We're pointing right here. What caused that spike in dividend yield? 4.09% it was, which is well above, I don't think it even got other than right here, 3.42. I mean, other than this right here, 3.42, it never even got below, above three. The, the dividend yield in the Vanguard value index, large cap value index, never got before above three other than one time. They got above four one time. Why? Man, look at freaking Michael. You guys are crushing. Jeff G and Michael drop in price 100%. Absolutely. Now, I don't think I – let's see if I can actually show it to you. Um, so I'm going to show you the actual dividend it paid. Uh, dividend's right here. Yeah, sweet. Oops. All right, so we're going to go – Come on. I think I got it. Ah. This is killing me. I think I got it in right there. Okay, sweet. So here we're gonna go. We're gonna see paying 38 cents a share. This is over the course of a year. 40 cents a share, 38, 37, 36. The dividends are dropping. 36, 35, 31. And this is the Vanguard Value Index Fund. 31. 37 and start going back up in 2003, 46, 55, 60, 70, 65, 50. That's the dividends. 46, 51. All right, so then it's been going up since. Anyway, that's the value index fund. And if we go back to... Um, So if we go back to uh, this guy, again, I mean, it's going up, going up, going down, way down, dude. way down, up, down. You know, it's been nice. Nice run there. 
the point being is now we have two Vanguard funds that are very well uh, good, been on for a long time, and they both had dividends that did not grow each and every year. And I mean, so now what I want to do is let's model SCHD, all right? Because I think a lot of people, and this is not against SCHD. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just saying at the end of the day, I think a lot of people have too short of a time memory to know, like this only been around since 2012. And I just, it's obviously going to have growing dividends since 2012. And we'll see. Yeah, look at these growing dividends. Okay, well, that's great. But that's that's 10 years. That's that doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't. So what's some other funds we want to model with uh with growing dividends that had growing dividends that has a track record going back to the 90s? Um, I don't know. I mean, again, Franklin Income Fund, I think it's got some bond funds in there. Um, we could do the American uh American income fund. Yeah, let's do that one. All right, we're gonna do uh AIVSX. Let's do that. Uh, Income Fund of America. That's Investment Company of America. Oh, that's a good one. That's a dividend fund, too. Investment Company of America. It goes back a long time. And we're going to go back and we're going to show you again the dividends. I mean, look, these are, I mean, here's the income on the portfolio. And this is a great fund. It goes back freaking to 1931, if memory serves, 32. That's a lot of variation in dividend of income. And again, there's some capital gains in there. Don't get me wrong, but of, of income, nonetheless, there's going to be a lot of variation there. Um, D, yeah, but, all right, there you go. Duke Energy. Let's take a look. I don't know if I can do. Or I don't know if I can do individual stocks. Well, but see that? Yeah, sweet. Look at that. Now that's different though, because so what I'm trying to say is, we're, we're we I I think it's uh, di individual dividend stocks is going to be different if you're going to buy individual stocks because yes, you can say these stocks have done performed well since the time immemorial, but the, the, the one company stock risk is is in, is there if that makes sense. Like Bethlehem Steel, you know, I mean, it's just I use that for an example in this Enron. Enron had a fat dividend. And I'm not saying it's going to happen to Duke Energy. What I'm just saying is, so you know, we can always look at one company and say that stock has done well. Uh, thus, I'm going to buy it. GE. I mean, look at GE for heaven's sake, man. But that's not something that I would recommend doing uh, my whole portfolio into like two or three individual stocks because they've always paid dividends. You could have done that with GE, Enron, and Bethlehem Steel, and uh, and got skunked. Warcom. I mean, there's a million different things there. But let's look at Duke, and we'll see its dividends. And I don't own Duke. Um, compounded annual growth rate, 5.1%. Standard deviation is about typical. But look at that drawdown right there. 71% in 2001 to 2003. I mean, look at that. Crazy. So let's see what they got from. Um, and there's their income. You can see it's steady. You know, dropped over here. Went from, again, that. Because there's no capital gains here. Obviously, they had a special dividend right there. I don't know what that was about. But that's pretty enticing to me. Look at that. You know, level, that's okay. Growing dividends. I like that. That's good stuff right there for sure. But at the end of the day, what scares me is that max drawdown is 71%. That's kind of, kind of nerve-wracking for sure. And then we just go to GE. And we can say, well, how about GE? You know, everyone, GE, what? Is it the ticker in GE anymore? General. General, okay. Remember, GE was freaking the blue chip of blue chip stocks, man. You know what I'm saying? And so we got GE. Um, I mean, oh yeah, yeah. and then their, their dividend, look at that. Nothing here. Look at that. Steady increasing dividends. Kaboom. Steady increasing dividends. Kaboom. Oh, oops. You know, the phone company. Let's look at AT&T. Now let's look at Intel. I like Intel. So, I mean, again, this is what I'm talking about. But we're going to look at Intel. And we're going to see steady increasing dividends. Oh, oops, 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 because they just cut their dividend. No dividends here. Steady increasing. Boom. Let's look at AT&T. And it's the same old story of all these companies now.
Steady increasing dividend. Oh, oops. Now the question, how these guys are actually paying their dividends, are they borrowing to pay their dividends? And the answer is yes, a lot of these companies are. Uh, they're borrowing to uh, to finance their dividends, which is why at some point they're going to have to cut back their dividends because they're freaking, their, their debt expense is so high. Uh, give me some mutual funds that go down. Yeah, yeah, Reed Stack, yeah, Reed's, uh, Sears, the old GM, 100%. Disney suspended their dividend for the last few years. Uh, again, this is not saying don't buy dividend stocks. I'm just trying to say is that at the end of the day, hey, is that Vanguard? Look at that Vanguard, Clownfish. You got a Vanguard ticker. You work, you work for Vanguard? Confish, um, I'm not, uh, let's see, no, it's a fun that I own. Yeah, but again, it's not going to be, these are four tickers. These aren't going to be uh, mutual funds. All right, so they're four tickers that don't have enough the track record. We can look at Noble. I mean, it's just not going to have enough track record. Noble, right? So right there. I mean, so no, if it has four letters, it doesn't have enough track record, man. It's got five letters for a mutual fund because no ETF goes back. You can say, I mean, I get there are some iShares that go back to 1993, but not like there's only 2014. There's just not enough time to see how it did in the old days. Um, PRDGX. All right, cool. Let's take a look at that. PRDGX. Is that a T Row Price Fund? Or is that, what is PRDGX? PRDGX. Yeah, T Row Price. Oh, there we go. Sweet. Good call. Good call. Who called that? Good call. You. So let's take a look at all right dividend growth and this goes back to 19 perfect right on man good max drawdown about 50 percent again i i don't people oh my goodness i i people have it that they're just going to live off the dividends they're not going to pay any attention to drawdowns and i i just i i don't believe that for two seconds i don't believe that for two seconds yep uh uh, let's see. Have coworker who has 85 rule and just waiting to get six months to 59 and a half. Just found his liver cancer. Damn, dude. So on Rumble, cracking egg, sweet wheat, tweet tweet has a coworker who was 85 rule, 50 and 35 years. Um, you know, he'd be 50 years old at 35 years or some combination thereof to 85. He's waiting six months to retire 59 and a half. Now he has liver cancer. That sucks. Donkey balls, man. No other way around that. Really? I hate hearing that crap. All right, so let's take a look. So these max drawdowns. So people say, oh, I'm just going to live off the income. Your portfolio is down 50%. You're telling me you're not going to jump out of a bridge, off a bridge? Yeah, you're going to. Uh, but let's take a look. So here's our same thing. If this is, I mean, it's a, I love the way that looks. It's very, it looks like the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Oops, oops. But it's not consistent dividends. Again, the, we aren't reinvesting dividends here, just as FYI. We're, uh, sure. We're, uh, we're living off the of dividends. Um, again, these aren't going to be all dividends. There is some capital gain in here from the income. I grant you. There's probably a big capital gain right there, a big capital gain right there. Yeah, that's, but that. So um, equity. Oh, hold on. I'm going to be right back. Actually, I'm going to take you guys with me. So I, I pulled off uh, Vanguard's website. Oof. Oh, man. I was actually doing some squats today for the first time in a couple of weeks. Oh, I'm going to be a sore boy tomorrow. I'm going to be a sore boy tomorrow, everybody. Sundown, get out of here. If I see you trying to steal Pablo from my tears. I'm trying to steal Pablo. Pablo doesn't take kindly people stealing him. Where is Pablo? Pablo. Yeah, there's Finn again. Get him. Pablo. Oh, my goodness. If I hear another SCHCD, I'm going to go nuts. Because um, it, it, it's, it's not, Jill. People, I mean, literally. So people, what the, it, it, they, they don't understand, man. Um, they, a KO. Oh, yeah, that's a good one right there. That's a Coke. Uh, good one. Good one, Mike. Yeah, there you go. KO. Oops, wrong one. Look at Coke. Right, let's see what their dividends are doing. Yeah, so that see that's per look at that. Now this is just halfway through the year. That looks pretty good right there. So that's that's what we're talking about. Now the, again, the question that comes to mind is: 
are they uh, – I don't I have no clue what their debt level is. I mean, we know that's what happened to AT&T. What's the other company? Um, Intel cut their dividend. Uh, GE, we, uh, there's a lot of companies out there with steady growth of dividends. We're financing dividends through debt acquisition, though, and that's not sustainable. Um, but anyway, but there you go. That's a great chart. We'd like to see that for sure. Was, and I'm not touching JNG as far as I can kick those clowns, scumbags. Um, if you weren't there, you're not a scumbag. Trust me. I was in the military. Um, you know, American military has hurt a lot of people, man. Hurt a lot of people. You know, I don't bl don't blame me. You blame the player, not the you blame the the game, not the player. That's for sure. Here's J and J. Um, yeah, again, same kind of thing. Look at that steady growth of dividends. Uh, obviously, with J and J, these dividends are off the backs of innocent people. You know what I'm saying? But uh, be that as it may, that's a good stock there for that stuff right there. So here you say, look, man. So here's 2000, uh, yeah, 2009. We're getting 5,800 bucks of uh, income off J and J. 2009. The portfolio is worth um, right here at the end of 2009, uh, 195,000 schmackaroonies. So we are getting uh, 5,800. That's going to be about three and a half percent dividend yield. Yeah, that's okay. Nothing right home well, but we'll take it for sure. You know what I'm saying? So that that's good. And then we got we're we're growing, you know, from uh, six eight hundred to seventy two hundred. So six so seventy two hundred was it seventy two ninety seven minus six eight four one divided by six eight four one. Yeah, so that's a growth of six percent on dividends. That's exactly what we want to see. We want to see the growing dividends to keep up with inflation. Exactly something like that. One hundred percent. Um, that's, no, that's a good call, man. Um, good call. Where's the, uh, J and J we did J and J. Yeah. Okay. But here's the issue. Everyone says pick blue, good blue chip stocks, dude, Intel freaking AT&T, um, the big one, GE. You could not have picked a bluer chip stock than GE, is what I'm trying to say. And yet people act as if it's just, just pick good blue chip stocks. I mean, you, I, I, I don't get the mentality that thinks this is just, I just pick some blue chip stocks. As if their blue chip stocks don't become red, i.e. they go under. And of course they do. So if you're going to divide a portfolio of 15 to 20 stocks, that's, that's fine. I get no qualm with that. In fact, I would divide, devise a portfolio just like what this guy just said. You buy some stocks that have a proven record of advancing dividends, increasing their dividend appreciation. But you got to look at the debt levels, too. You got to look at the debt levels. If, the, if they're financing their dividends off debt, that's not sustainable. And they're going to cut their dividend. And what happens when they cut their dividend? The price goes down, dude, big time. And so now your dividend has, has been cut. And you're like, well, I'm not getting as much income as I was. I was relying on that income to beat inflation. And now the price is down 25 to 30%. And now I got to sell shares. So Jill says it right. It's like, so a lot of times, um, Jill, a lot of people say, I'm just going to live off the income off my dividends, as if the dividends never get cut. And when dividends get cut, wh where's your income coming from then? You have to sell shares. You know, shares are going to be worth less because dividends get cut. It drives share price down. No other way around it. And you're like, uh, I wasn't expecting that. But yeah, I mean, you can absolutely divide devise a portfolio of good, good being hopefully low debt companies that have, that pay dividends, are growing dividends by cash flow operations. One hundred percent. How much time and energy is gonna is that gonna be to find those companies? And then you're not the only one who's found those companies. Everyone else knows these companies too. On top of that, how is a manager of these places? And on top of that, how much risk, single stock risk are you taking? Was I posted something on my YouTube channel the other day about, oh, First Republic Bank, dude. You know what I'm saying? I mean, again, another, oh, I mean, dude, everyone acts like out of the fact that, oh, well, First Republic, you know, blah, blah, blah. dude, First Republic was trading like 200 bucks just a few months back. Silicon Valley Bank, no one knew what no one knew. You know what I'm saying? It's like no one knows this stuff. Anyway, the point being is this is why you have to have the barbell. Because when the dividends get cut, when the price goes down, you have to have some source of income elsewhere other than selling a stock that's been down 25%. You have to. 
and and this idea that we can just buy these good individual stocks. I don't even know what LMT is. What's that uh, LMT? Um, let's look at LMT. Oops, I'm going to share. It's actually pretty funny because uh, my a guy I used to work with my, with my boss was a broker at Smith Barney. It was Lake Mason. LMT. Oh, oh, yeah, Lockheed Martin. oh, great. Now we're getting involved in the war machine. And I look again, if you work at Lockheed Martin, my granddad retired from Lockheed Martin. My uncle is a, was a helicopter pilot. Now he works for Sikorsky or whatever that place is called. Don't, don't be all offended. I can't believe it. It's, it's okay. We all got bills to pay, man. Yeah. So there's Lockheed Martin. All right. So a little bit down here, but not much. It's growing, growing. So that looks pretty good right there, 100%. So it's growing, drops, growing. And they're, you know, basically your taxes are going right back to you in, di in dividends because of the uh, war machine. So you might as well take advantage of it for sure. But again, I don't know what the debt levels are. I'm just, what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, the debt levels have got to be looked at for sure. And if you think you're going to rely on 10 good quality stocks to manage your retirement, that's, that would scare the living bejesus out of me, man. You would like 25 to 30 individual stocks, uh, which pay a growing dividend. But that's how you beat inflation right there, is a growing dividend for sure. Growing dividends that can be counted on, but aren't being financed by debt. And again, the problem is if we go into a recession or a depression, are these companies going to be able to grow their dividends given that cash flow, uh, net operating cash flow, from, cash flow from operations is going to be lessened? I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. But it's nice to see these companies that this guy, Mike Schumann, pointed out that's showing that they were able to do it during the odds and during you know, 2007, 89. That's good to see. That's good to see. I actually, I'm kind of keen on REITs. Hey, uh, Todd Gray, what's the Vanguard uh, REIT um, ticker? Vanguard read ticker. Yeah, one hundred percent. Now I will say, it's something pretty cool about having a. Yeah, there you go, man. Right here. So let's look at Chevron S C V X and Northern Captains from Maine. So, you know, not the brightest bulb, but uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll see what he's looking at here. C H V C H V Chevron. Did you say C H V? I just see oh, CVX CVX. No, I like REITs CVX. Why is that showing up? CVX. Yeah. TX. Oh, CVX. Yeah, I probably got a little bit dyslexia. Shoot, you know, kill me. All right, so, uh, Yeah, look at that. See, again, it's good stuff across the board. And the low debt, man, that's huge. So, again, what we do is we look at, two, let's look at 2006, 2100 bucks. Now, let's look at 2007, 2371, 2008, 2654. That's, what, that's a 12% dividend increase, man. That's what you want to see. I don't have any idea what their debt load is. I wonder if they show it on... Portfolio visualizer, I doubt it. Metrics, I bet they don't. Um, that's what you want to see right there. Uh, they show the debt load, drawdowns, assets. Yeah. Um, you guys, the uh, VMB is at the Vanguard uh, REITs. Yeah, well, that's that's my concern too, Jill. All it takes is one or two, and your freaking goose is cooked. Your goose is cooked. Yeah, there you go. We got. Yeah. Yeah. So the so this way here on Rumble, Sears, Kmart, a couple of companies here that uh, were blue chips before. Um, Hawk nuts. See, uh, Chevron is going ESG. Anyway, but what happened was none of these companies, no one knew these companies were going bankrupt until they went bankrupt, if that makes sense. Um, 
well, you're getting about you know 15. I'm not building a portfolio of about 15. I'm looking for mutual funds. Good. All right, Mike. Look, Mike wants everybody to, to say, wow, Mike, you're so smart. Good. You got some good stocks in there. I got no qualm with that. I got no qualm with that at all. What I'm trying to say is the idea that dividends are the panacea for people as if we can just buy some good companies and say, oh, I got some good companies. It'll be good. And live off the dividends, the income they give us when we know for a fact Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund, Vanguard Value Income Fund, or uh, Value Growth Value Index Fund, the T. Rowe Price Fund we just talked about. The fact that these things could not do it should tell somebody something. The Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund could not keep up a steady stream of dividends. I, the idea that old Mike here says, look at these stocks, they've all done it. This is called survivorship bias, my friends. We forget about the companies that did not do it. Do you think GE was not in the aristocrats? Do you think Intel was not in the aristocrats or the growing dividend things? Do you think that were, they weren't in there? Come on, man. Come on. Yeah, and 51, look, I don't, do get whoever the hell he wants it. It's fun. I don't care. I'm just saying at the end of the day, the cockiness of some of these guys with their, I got a 51 stocks so and the dividends. Oh my goodness, they all grow. Notice how Mike didn't say anything about GE. Didn't say anything about friggin' Intel. Didn't say anything about these other ones. You see what I'm saying? It's called survivorship bias. I'm just trying to prepare people like, look, if you think you're going to live off your dividends alone, you're wrong. Unless you're willing to take a hit to your income. That's okay. It's okay to take a hit to your income. How are you going to pay the bills, though, if that hits your income means you don't have enough cash to pay the bills? Yeah, until they bounce back. That's I, I, Look, I'm not, again, this isn't to say a lot of people are in for AT&T. There's another one, AT&T, too. I mean, Verizon, everyone's like, Verizon, Verizon. Like, how much freaking debt does Verizon have? I, I, it's crazy to me. I don't get it. The point being at the overall scheme of things is that growing dividends are your way to protect yourself from inflation. That's a fact. If you think, though, just because these funds have done that or these companies have done that, SCHD has done it since 2012. Whip the flip and do. Lockheed Martin has done it since 1985. That's freaking awesome. That's freaking awesome. I'm happy to see that. Coke, look, those stocks look great. They look great. But if you think that in of itself, there's no downside risk there. What, may I introduce you to my friend Intel? I introduce you to my friend AT and T, WorldCom. Does not anyone remember WorldCom, dude? I used to freaking sell options on WorldCom when I was working at Schwab because WorldCom had a fat dividend on top of low PE. Uh, bank stocks. We had I had freaking bank stocks because you get a fat dividend on bank stocks with a low price earnings ratio. Why you're waiting for the price to appreciate. Then what happened? 2007 came and oh, didn't work out so well. But no one talks about this. No one talks about this. They all talk about freaking their stocks have had growing dividends forever. And I'm like, okay. So what happened when he had freaking Bank of America preferred or Bank of America stock? Let's look at BOA. I haven't looked at it. BAC, I think is what Bank of America is. I forgot. Let's take a look. What did Bank of America dividend do? I, I've been a long. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Blink. Bank of America. We'll see their dividend here. Oh, it, I, I, ah, it's just it's the same old story, man. Penny. I showed you articles. Let's see if I can't find it from uh, Money Magazine. I probably won't be able to find it on the fly, but I'm going to try anyway. That's my commitment to my audience. My commitment to my audience. I'm kind of a hoarder when it comes to this stuff, by the way. I got papers on top of papers, white papers on top of white papers, research on top of research on everything back there. Everything. Old Social Security statements. Right here. Well, here's a good one. This is from uh, where's this one? Business Week. 
In the past year, Enron stock price has more than doubled to 7306 with shares trading at a lofty 44 times earnings. Enron had a great run, said Oscar Castro, manager of Montgomery Global Communications Fund, but still a good long-term investment. Oh, this is in 2000. I printed off in 2007. This is in 2000. Another fan, Christopher Wolf, equity strategist at J.P. Morgan, expects Enron share price to hit 100 during the next six months. Now, it's all easy to laugh at these guys after, after the fact. I'm just saying the, the point being no one knows nothing about nothing until until it goes down like this right here. But I want to show you something else here. If I can find my article. A Cooling World. You didn't see that? A Cooling World Science Magazine. A Cooling World, 1975. Global cooling, baby. How dare you, Josh? Global warming. We're all going to die from global warming. Don't you know? Don't you know? One second. I'm going to find this article I have because it is. It was a sucker's bet, it turned out. And some of us crazy cats might even fell for it. Papers. All right, one sec. I'm going to show you my other stuff here. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Some papers. World's oldest fossil fuels found in Greenland. Remember how they found, uh, why was Werner von Braun going to, uh, where to go? Not Antarctica, uh, North Pole. The same time Apollo Eleven was in on the moon. We're there. Why was Werner von Braun the Nazi going to North Pole the same time the boys, Buzz, Michael, and Neil were up on the moon? The importance of U.S. gas and oil. And I just I got so much freaking reading material. It's insane, dude. Insanity. Insanity. A practical approach to motor vehicle engineering and maintenance. Oh, lots of fun stuff in here. Ooh. Review and summary of the three important at atmospheric physics papers. Yeah, physicists think they're all that in a bag of chips. Is there anything more annoying than a theoretical physicist? He's like, I'm so smart. Or no, maybe astrophysicists are the most annoying people in the world. Oh, because astrophysicists are desperate to be taken seriously because they're not taken seriously, but they want so bad to be taken seriously. It's kind of like economists. They want economists has economists has physics envy. Physicists have math envy is what it is. And astrophysicists, basically, they're just kind of like uh, the redhead stepchild of physicists. They're like, eh, eh, OK, whatever. Right here. Why banks beat bonds. Here it is. In 2007. Uh, let's see. Would it be great if you could find the ideal blend, an investment that combined the cozy security of government bonds with the double-digit returns you could expect from stocks? See you, Denise. That seems like a pipe dream in a world where 10-year treasuries yield 5% and equity sell at a premium that augur a dim future. But this ideal investment exists. It's called a bank stock. Hold that yawn. Bank stocks offer a sterling array of qualities. They pay huge dividends, approaching 5% yield that are bound to keep rising, says Sean Tully from Fortune magazine. And they're incredibly cheap, and their, their prospects for growth are surprisingly sprite. Bank America, Citigroup, and Wachovia are all excellent choices right now. Wow. It gets better. Dividends are likely to keep growing. Bank of America, for example, expected to raise its payout about 11% in July, bringing the yield to an extraordinary 5.1%. Oh, my lands. But this is a case where the market seems to be wrong because markets were pricing in the bank stocks pretty poorly. Investors fear a credit meltdown because of woes and subprime, says an, an analyst with Morgan Stanley. Not one of these banks has troubling exposure to subprime credit since they sell almost all such loans to institutional investors. Hmm, interesting. And I just showed you what happened there. This is not to say don't invest. 
Don't buy dividend stocks. This is to say, if you're freaking thinking you're going to live solely on your growing dividends, I would, and you're going to have two or three, you know, maybe 20 stocks, I'd say you better think again. If the Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund couldn't do it, the T. Rowe Price Dividend Appreciation Fund couldn't do it, what's the likelihood that you're going to be able to do it? It's not high, dude. It's not high. And that, again, that doesn't mean don't buy dividends. It just means at the end of the day, we need some freaking realistic expectations. Um, we, uh, yeah, 100%. So Mike says uh, get, uh, dividend investors fare uh, fair, uh, better in bear markets. That's my premise, 100%. My premise is, though, bear markets and living off dividend income are two completely different. People have an ex expectation they can just live off increasing dividend yields, not yields, dividend actual cash. And I would, I'd want to uh, uh, dampen the expectation for people to recognize you still need a bunch of freaking cash. Cash pays the bills. Dividends become cash, which pays the bills. You see what I'm saying? Cash is king, forever will be. Dividends, while I like them, and that's your best bet to fight inflation, and during deflation, dividends are good. But you use dividends to, to, to convert to cash, which pays the bills. And if you have this expectation that, oh, I'm just going to live off my dividend income, that's just don't, I don't know what to tell you, man. I, I literally, the what you'll find in investments is all these people who have, again, survivor bias. They just look at their winners. They don't tell you about the losers. And they'll always say, oh, hindsight, we knew that Enron was a, uh, a sham. Hindsight, we knew that this, that, and the other. You know, like, dude, hindsight, at the end of the day, I lost money in, in WorldCom. Again, WorldCom had a fat dividend, a low PE. It was heavy with debt, but I said, oh, man, they're a growing enterprise. I used to freaking sell options on that. I, got, I didn't get smoked on that. I got smoked on PetSmart options, what I got smoked on. But WorldCom... I did take on the chin. And this is back in 99, 2000. Anyway, it's just kind of funny. A lot of people new to the investment game. You know, the FIRE movement has created a lot of these guys. They, they haven't been around long enough to have any exposure to real down markets. They don't. And real sus steady, sustainable down markets, 2000, 2001, 2007, 89. You got a little bit of a bear market in the, you know, the uh, 2020. We had, you know, last year was bad for, for bond markets in particular. For stocks, was that bad? Um, yeah, one hundred percent. A lot of see it, but the risk and small. This is a, now that's a good. Tim makes a good observation. A lot of small banks have nice dividends. The problem with smaller banks now that's the concern we have. The the uh, big banks is the smaller banks going to have a harder time competing for deposits when they're not FDIC insured the way the big banks are. The guaranteed not to fail is uh, again is just more. You know, scumbaggery uh, to the big, the big entities, man, the big entities. And what happens is these small banks, unfortunately, like, you know, are they going to compete? You know, they're still heavily regulated, unfortunately, and they're going to be even more heavily regulated. They don't have the lobbying capacity as the big banks do. I mean, look at J.P. Morgan. J.P. buys First Republic, even though the law said they couldn't. I mean, literally, the law was that you could not do that, and they, they did. Because the law got did any, did any Congress vote on the change of the law? No, no, they didn't. So again, I like dividend stocks. So my, I got. Uh, let's take a look at Southern Company because that's I own Southern Company. I haven't looked at the only reason I bought Southern Company is because uh, that's my electricity provider, and I like the dividend. Imagine they'll have some debt because they're building out a nuclear power plant. But uh, all right, so let's see what they got for their dividends. Oh, yeah, look at that. Perfect. Love that. Right there. Fantastic. Would I put everything in my – I had in this? No. Would this be one of – you know, like that guy said he had 50 holdings? Absolutely. If you can have 50 individual stocks, freaking rock and rolling. There's no other way around that. That's – look at that. Great. Will that – is that guaranteed to continue? No. Do I think it will? I don't know. I hope so. I got Principal Financial Group in my, I own Principal Financial Group, EFG. Let's see what that's done. Insurance makes you a little bit nervous, right, because of all the the damage, if you know what I'm saying. Let's see what these guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, so you got some down dividends here, up. 
You know, is that going to be, I don't know what that's going to be, but it's nice to see your individual stocks paying cash. I'm not going to lie to you. And I reinvest in my shares, but if you have 50 stocks and they're all paying whatever, you know, 2% dividend, you know what I'm saying? It's nice to see that income come in and you can live off that, but you can't live off it. It's not growing, which is why you still need cash. Dude. Everyone's got to have cash. I see. That's the thing, Jill. I, I don't, people forget this. It's, I mean, I, I just, we just looked at Bank America, for instance, and people are like, oh, I'm just living off the dividends, but your dividends were reduced significantly. So what did you do then? So now you're down you know, 40%. Your dividends aren't paying anything what you expected. You still need that money to live on, and, and you're going to have to sell shares. Um, uh, <laughs> did they do the pacer? Wasn't it the AMC pacer? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Mike. I'm not doing uh, my I I 100% agree, with Mike. 100% agree, with Mike. Is that I'm not doing? I mean, you people could do growth. I got no problem. With that. I I I want to see the cash. 100%. Yeah, to get a C exactly to get a CBDC. So just go back to what Mike was saying. 50 stocks is probably where you need to be. 30. You need at least 35 stocks in modern. Uh, theory to be truly diversified. Um, you know, so if you had a hundred shares of each stock and let's just, I mean, that's, you really want round lots. You don't have to have, but you really need about 35 stocks or so. If you can find 35 good hitting stocks that are paying dividends, they've done it consistently, even if they have some drops on occasion, it's going to be tough to beat that portfolio, but you still got to have cash, man. Cash is cash. No, I mean, cash is trash until your world turns the garbage right on. You still got to have cash on the side some, in some capacity. But, yeah, man, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm trying to build a portfolio of about 30 stocks or so, all dividend payers, and just never touch them again. Sherry's story, I never forget how these guys, they they lived, they had uh, they had land, a lot of land in Delaware. They're from South Alabama, so it's kind of funny when they came to my office in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, anyone here still? On the Rumble? I like credit unions. Yeah, credit unions, absolutely. The biggest credit union is Navy Federal, by far and away the biggest credit union. So my concern is a lot of credit unions are operating on very thin margins. Are they going to get bought out by Navy Federal? Because their margins are very, very, very thin. Anyway, so these guys came to my office in Center City. They went to one of my seminars. And um, you know, deep Southern accents, even though they lived in Delaware. I can't remember why they uh, moved to Delaware or not. But uh, anyway, long story short. So uh, they told me a story. The wife wanted uh, they put their first stocks they bought were in like the sixties or something like that. The wife bought uh, these are farmers with a lot of land. Uh, the wife bought McDonald's. The husband bought TWA. Isn't that funny? And my granddad used to fly for TWA. As a matter of fact, when he got out of the Navy, he was a pilot for TWA. We all know what happened to TWA. Um, actually, what's McDonald's doing? I haven't. What's their dividend? Let's take a look. It's just kind of funny. So long story short, we got a good chuckle out of that. And then uh, uh, <laughs> to, to say thanks for meeting me, they sent me a $20 McDonald's gift card. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Southern people crush. It's a lot of good northern people too, but you know, by and large, southern people are going to be nicer than northern people, by and large. That doesn't mean there's not some – I'm from – I'm a Yankee dude, but just – you know what I'm talking about. So here's McDonald's. Let's see. So it looks like they didn't pay much back then. I can tell. Oh, wait. No, it goes back to 85. All right, sweet. Yeah, so there's some growing dividends. I have no idea what the debt is. I the debt's what scares me, man. The debt load. Pacer, yep. Pacer, man. 100%. So credit unions used to be for the uh, uh, for the, dis, the unbanked. You know, they always said the unbanked. So we're going to open up credit unions for, and that makes sense. You know, the Mennonites. You know what I'm saying? The uh, yeah, you know, the local community, but now credit unions. My business account is with Her uh, Navy Wealth, Navy Wealth Manager, uh, with Navy Federal Credit Union. It's kind of crazy. Like credit unions have the advantages of no tax, uh, so they should be able to give you a better rate. I, I talked to a couple people lately. Their credit unions aren't paying them crap. I said, dude, what, what's going on there? Credit unions? You freaking get tax advantage over the big banks, community banks in particular. You're not offering any kind of crap on on deposit products. What's that about? Uh, all right so what else you guys want to talk about that was all i had tonight just want to kind of run a 
I'm in a spot where the next phase is building more cash. Yeah, see, so I'm in a spot where I want to probably be like this guy. What's his name up here? Mike or, uh, Mike Schumer. I don't know how old. He's probably old. Yeah, I'm not sure. But he's been through three bear markets, so he's probably my age. So by the time I'm 60, I'm 52, I would like to have enough income off my stock portfolio to live on dividend-wise. That's my goal, 100%, with a bunch of money in cash, without question. That's your best bet against inflation, without question. That's your best bet against inflation, your best bet against deflation. If, we're rely if our reliance is on capital appreciation, I actually think those days are coming to an end. I really, really do. And I'll share that with you in a different video. Going back to this, uh, this uh, what I'm reading right now, um, I think that the capital appreciation days are, are going to be behind us. That doesn't mean there's not going to be appreciation. Yeah, TWA is funny, man. You'd be able to sleep if you had a number of them, Charlie. If you had, you know, like that guy had 51, I think, you'd be able to sleep. You would. You know, one or two is not going to be. I mean, that's, you know, if you look at high, uh, yeah, 100%. But at least you get to pick the stocks you want. If you look at the high um, the high yield fund, I remember you know, I first worked at Vanguard in, the, in what, 98. In the Vanguard high yield fund, um, we actually did a study that said, I can't remember. Like even if two percent of the bonds went could put, it was only going to take like a dollar, like a couple pennies off the price per share, or something like that. Because it had so many bonds, um, but it, it was something like that. So even if you had thirty to forty stocks and one or two went could put, it's not going to break the bank. The problem is, is that you're the one who's got to be responsible for the for buying the stock and owning it and holding. It. And an ETF, at least, you don't have to worry about that. V V Y M. All right, let's take a look. Yeah, my uh, my taxable account, Nicholas, is all VTI, all right? And I don't have much of my taxable. Uh, pretty much, I, I I got I had to pay a bunch of taxes, so I sold a, a lot of uh, the bulk of my taxable position was sold to pay taxes. So now everything's my Roth, one hundred percent. But if you know, but you, if you want qualified dividends in your taxable account, that's fine. Just gotta be careful when it comes to Obamacare. You know, I mean, this is an issue now. So ideally, you want your dividends in your Roth for sure. Without question, um, but you know, if, if a taxable accounts, you know, get, get a get an ETF. You know, I, I wouldn't get high dividends in a in a uh, in a taxable account with with uh, Obamacare premiums uh, subsidies we're trying to get, but I would be a, uh, but certainly in a Roth and a, you know, you get a VTI. It's got a you know what a yield of one and a half. No big deal. I was so what was the guy said BYM? What's BYM? Let's take a look at that. So I like your. I like this uh, exercise there, Mike. Some of these tickers look pretty good to me, man. Uh, I like that. I'm not. I just don't know if I can buy some of these stocks. My conscience, like, can I buy McDonald's knowing what they're polluting people? I, I just this is the issue I'm dealing with. I'm doing okay. So, is it, so again, it's a three ticker. All right, it's a three letter symbol. As an ETF, it's not going to be bad. See, we don't have enough time frame. But that's still better than some of these other ones. So let's take a look. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's see. We just we don't have anything to start with over here. BYM. So again, let's go back to VDIGX. There's 40 stocks in there, dividend growth stocks. I can't remember if it's open again to new investors. I don't recall. It goes back to 1993. And it, see, look at that. Shoops. Now, People could say it's because the portfolio manager sucks. Dude, the guy just crushed, man. This guy crushes. But you know, if you go back to 1993, 4% compounded, compounded annual growth rate. It's not going to get the job done. Yeah, that's actually worse than I thought. So I don't know if they changed managers or something like that. That's not very impressive. Oh, wait, because we weren't reinvesting. We got to reinvest. Hold on just a second. All right, there we go. So the dividends reinvested double the compound annual growth rate. So this guy's doubling the money every nine years. Um, so you see the difference there? 4% versus uh, you know, basically 9% essentially just by reinvesting the dividends. But again, look at that, man. That's, that's a good fund all the way around that. Anyway, so if, if it's got a three ticker... It's either going to be an individual stock or an ETF. It won't be a mutual fund. 
Yeah, no, I, Mike, I got smoked on the cues, dude. What WSR? What's that? I got smoked on the cues back in the day. Ninety nine. Loving me some cues. Oh, there you go. Those are cute. Two thousand one, and then two, and then three. Was not loving me some cues anymore. Ooh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it just doesn't have enough time. See, my concern about REITs is I'm not I'm not sure I trust these guys. To be honest with you. Um. Why is the income dropping off there too? What's the freaking Vanguard read ticker? Uh, I've been using USA for 16 years. I TV bank for a few years during that time. Yeah, yeah, I've been a member of USA for a long, long time. Kind of getting my nerves. Um, what? Are, yeah, I got no problem with mid caps. I mean, just buy the end. I mean, frankly, I'd buy. I just buy. If you buy VTI, you're getting large, mid, and small. Buy. All right. Yeah. See, that's a ticker. I need the mutual fund. I. I don't want the. I don't want the ETF. I want the mutual fund. So look up the Vanguard mutual fund REIT. I want to see what that's done. Anyway, the point being is that the. Uh, is that you can own mid caps. Well, I get that specific. That frankly bores me. Um, I'd like to a. Uh, a good balance of real estate, mutual funds, CDs, 100% Tim. Yeah, see, it's not going to have enough. It's not enough time frame. I, I need to have longer time frames. All right, so if it doesn't have enough time frame, what's STK? Chicken Charlie says STK. Let's take a look. So, yeah. I mean, Seligman, that, that fun, this, that's funny. This Again, it's going to be an ETF here. This doesn't have enough time. But what I saw it says Seligman. Well, check this out. Seligman, back in the day, back in the late 90s, was taken off like a bat out of hell. And then they got spanked. And I don't, you know, it's just it's funny that there's now Columbia Seligman. It's kind of like the Kauffman Fund. I can't remember the name of that, uh, the ticker Kauffman Fund. Yeah, Federated Kauffman Fund. These guys were kicking ass and taking names. One of my first mutual funds I ever bought. And then they got uh, bought out by Federated. Uh, why? Oh, weird. It only goes back to 2002. Why? Why did we lose the previous year's por portfolio uh, growth performance? Why? Why does Kauffman Fund only go back to 2002 when it's, it goes back longer than that? What happened? And, and I haven't looked at it, but it might be in Yahoo Finance. I don't know. But isn't that interesting? The Kauffman Fund has been around a lot longer since 2002. So where is the previous history of it? Kind of weird. Compounded annual growth right here is 7.91. The fee on this guy was like two and a quarter, too. It's crazy. I, this is before I knew anything about anything. Uh, I'm not sure if it shows the fees on here or not. Yeah, mid-cap growth. So today, what happened? Why, why don't we see the rest of the performance? Uh, because we pretend it doesn't exist. Survivorship bias. All right, v, all right thank you. VGSLX. There you go. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. VGSLX. VGSLX. So let's take a look at VGSLX, shall we? Yes, we shall. VGSLX. Let's probably go back to 1988 or something. Like that. That's it. Nah, dude. 2002? That went back longer than that. Here's my Vanguard stuff. That's the... Uh, Equity income fund. Let's look at that. There we go. Vanguard Value Index, Equity Income, Explore, Vanguard U.S. Growth Fund, Windsor Fund, and a couple bond funds from Vanguard go back in the before the, uh, the late seventies, early seventies, late seventies, and eighties. All right, cool. So let's let's just look at uh, the read here and the compounding annual growth rate. Probably yeah, oh, it's not bad. Dude. Eight point seven three, max drawdown. Woo, Nelly, you got crushed. That's got to be two thousand eight. Yeah, look at that thing. Here's the income. So right here, 2009, paid 811 schmackeroonies on a portfolio that is worth uh, right there, 18, 19,000 bucks. So it paid 800 bucks on a portfolio that's worth 19,000. Still a 4.2% yield. Not that's not great. 
Uh, but February 2009 is down to nine. So let's go to January. December 2008 was worth 14,000 bucks. 2008, it paid 1,100 bucks. Is worth uh, fourteen thousand. Oops. The eight point two percent yield right there. Let's take a look over here now. Uh, two thousand and twenty-two. It paid twenty-two hundred schmackaroonies on a portfolio that's worth. Fifty-eight thousand. Not that's that's not good, man. That's not high. That's about like three and a half percent. Yeah, three point seven. I just take the bond. I, I but the, I guess eh, there is appreciation here, where the bond doesn't give you appreciation. The uh, actually it's interesting. Um, right on. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Get my book. You know it. South Texas in the house. Tim, how freaking double dog dare you? You don't have it yet? How double dog dare you? I just ordered 25 copies, by the way. I'm going to send one to Jill because she, uh, um, she, what did she do? She edited it for me. Uh, sometime I'll probably sell them with a signature. I know it sounds bad. Dude, I got to raise money, man. Time's getting tight. Got to raise money. So I'll probably uh I'll probably sell like you want a signed copy, you know, for like 20 bucks or something like that. How dare you? How dare you? Yeah, don't buy it. I'm kidding. Um anyway, hey, thanks, Dad. Um on NUE. I don't even know what that is. It's NUE. Sundown, never forget when I see you creep in. Yeah, new car. All right, yeah. I haven't looked at the stock. I know they're hurting for employees, that's for sure. Was that you who sent that to me, Tim? I like Nucor. Anything that's a power. What happened there? Wow. Now that's interesting. Ooh, let's take a look at Nucor. Let me do my phone. Ooh. I'm, ooh. That gets me all hot and bothered. Nucor. And you e right. Let's go to sundown. Never forget. If I see you coming around, you're gonna get hit. It's a pretty good song, that guy, Gordon Lightfoot. I mean, other than Edmund Edmund Fitzgerald or whatever it's called, I don't know anything else he does. Of that sundown song, I like it. If I see you googling eyes, my wife Charlotte. Oh, there you go. Sundown, you're gonna get hit if I see you sending Google eyes to uh, pretty Charlotte. Charlotte's my wife. Um, I'm just being silly, guys. All right, so here we got Nucor. Pete, what? Oh, okay. two bucks a share in the dividend price, 150. I just only got that. It's really 12 months. Something's gone wrong here. What's going on? Why is the PE ratio so low? Huh. Let's take a look at the financials. Again, it's just Yahoo Finance. I don't know. I mean, how much of freaking debt they got here? You don't see one. Yeah. I haven't looked at stocks for a while, so just bear with me just a second. We want to look at the balance sheet. Ah, hold on a second. Balance sheet. I always worried about the debt. Debt, 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 debt. Four point three billion to uh, yeah to seven six and a half billion. That's kind of concerning. Where's the uh, income statement? There's a cash flow camera. Let's look at the uh, repayment is repayment of debt. All right, they're paying some debt back. Where is the issue? The freaking debt, the uh, dividend. They got a bunch of cash. So I like that, man. So they took on now that debt. They got a bunch of cash. That's pretty. 
That's an invest in cash flow. I, that, see, I, I'm not. They issued two billion dollars of debt, and they, you know, they got a bunch of cash. They were paying some debt off. That's good. They bought back some of their shares. Look at that. Repurchased capital stock. It's under income stat. I thought the dividends was under cash flow. Where's the dividend? Yeah, okay. The freaking dividend, dude. I just want to see their dividend, how much they're paying on dividend. We could look it up if we wanted to uh, divide their uh, their earnings or divide their dividend per share by the number of shares outstanding, but I don't want to do that. Um, expenses. I should be dividend. Where's the freaking dividend on here? Interest income, interest income, interest income. I'm drawing a blank, dude. They're not coming under the cash balance sheet. Allow the dividend pay out beyond the balance sheet. Cash like equity. What the hell's a freaking dividend payout, dude? What am I missing here? Total debt. Net debt. So one of the things that my mom used to teach me on is the current assets. The total cash uh, divided by, or the total liabilities divided by the current cash. So they're, they're so you have current assets and I forgot what the other term was, but you take current cash, you take total debt divided by current cash. So right now they got, according to this thing here, and we're just doing a, a quick run through, we're saying they have um, total debt 6.69 billion schmackaroonies. All right. And then we got uh, assets here. Current assets, 14 billion, but how much of that current assets is cash? 4.857 of cash on a total debt 6.99. That's actually a pretty good ratio. The current, uh, so the cash you got, you know, basically five billion in cash, and then you look at from uh, uh, short term debt, uh, current assets, like accounts payable. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna be cash flow. I can't remember what this crap was. Operating cash flow, financing, I can't remember. But um, you can find the current assets real quick. Someone will have the the, the, the thing on that. And I, can't, I just, off the top of that camera, what it was, a good ratio. But definitely more than one. One, uh, You want enough cash to pay your bills, for sure. Um, if you have enough cash to pay all of your bills, that's great. I don't even think it matters anymore, to be honest. With you. I'm, I'm not convinced, guys, that um, you read a random walk down Wall Street. You know, you read guys who are make a career out of investing. You can look at all the freaking cash flow statements. You can look at all the stuff. Even uh, what's his name? Uh, freaking um, uh, Benjamin Graham said in 1976, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, the, the, the stock market is not, you're not going to find relative to the free cash flow, you know, your freaking, you know, how much your current assets are, your current ratio, your price to book. Uh, those are, the old days, but now all this stuff is going anyway. So it's, it's this where the random walk down Wall Street comes from. Uh, no one knows what, what stocks are going to do well. No one does. Um, but with that said, I still rather have a stock that doesn't have any debt. That's just a fact. So just the way I look at it. Um, oh, there you go. Put a Pablo Pop. That's a good idea. I don't know what MPLX is. Um, if you could read my mind, you would go crazy. Click on statistics tab. Oh, there you go. All right, sweet. Yeah, yeah there you go. Look at my man Hodges. Look at Hodges. Ooh, Nucor bought the company that makes a steel utility pole in America. Interesting. I like that. Um, so let's look, let's go back and then we're going to land the plane. Let's look at statistics. How dare you tell me what to do, Hodges? How dare you? Let me just say statistics. Oh. All right, then. There you go. Why is the freaking PE so low? That, man, that bothers me. Price of book, that's low. I like seeing that. Yeah, okay. 
So return on assets. All right. So remember, ROE, return on equity. We can uh, we can taking a lot of debt, i.e., leverage, can make your ROE pop. So always remember that a high ROE, if it's based on leverage, that's not good. All right. But the fact we got eighteen percent return on ROA, return on assets. Again, I'm not. This is. I don't analyze stocks. It doesn't matter if I did or not anyway. No one knows nothing, but just keep in the back of your mind. Uh, return on equity can be goosed very, very easily by taking on leverage. That's just a fact, Jack. Um, so we're looking total cash. There you go. Right here. All right, sweet. Yeah, hey, current ratio. Three. Ooh, look at that. I like that. Book value per share. So it's trading what? Two. What's the book? What's the share price right now? 147, 145. So it's basic trading at uh, uh, price to book is about two to one price to book, which is uh, which is actually reasonable, man, in this day and age. Uh, and that debt is concerning, but they got four point six billion. That's interesting. Of cash, and they're making money. You know, they're they're making money, dude. That's interesting stock there, uh, whoever, uh, Tim, was it Tim who said that? That's an interesting stock. Look at that revenue. Revenue per share. Gross profit. Earnings before debt, interest, taxes, and appreciation. Uh, debt, earnings before taxes, depreciation, amortization, and interest. Earnings before interest, taxes. Did they spell this wrong? EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's a lot of money they're making. I mean, literally, just on their net earnings, they could pay off their freaking, all their debt, and probably pay off their dividend, too. I don't know, man. Looks pretty good to me. Not going to lie to you. I, I'm, I'm a fan. I hope they're not woke. They probably are. Everybody's got to be woke anymore. That looks pretty good. And I like the fact they bought the only company that makes steel poles in the United States. That's uh, that's favorable. That's favorable. Yeah, got to vote early and vote often for sure. QSR. What's QSR? Quasar. It's my first TV we ever had. QSR. QSR is Restaurant Brands International. Oops. Hey. Let's take a look. QSR. I'll go back to 2015. All right, my friends. I'm getting tired, man. Let's land this plane. Um, I've been using uh, Jeremy and Everson. When I went into my surgery, I was saying, Fellers, it's been good to know you. Yeah, right on, man. What kind of surgery did you have there? I think Steve on Rumble, what kind of surgery did you have? Uh, surgery to open up your brain? Brain surgery to open up your mind? Doing Burger King Tim Hortons. I bought, uh, so when, <laughs> don't listen to me for investment advice, dude. I'm just telling you right now. So back when I was managing my bar, we, uh, as long as Americans buy alcohol, new core will stay in biz. I don't get it. Well, I don't get that. Why? Why do you say that? So uh, I, I was in and out of XOM, Steve. I bought XOM. I wrote it. I basically got, I bought it at what, 38, wrote it to about 70, sold it. Now XOM is at like 115. Yeah, there you go. Your old buddy Josh. Your old buddy Josh, XOM. And I'm in UGI. I bought UGI instead. So I trade out XOM for UGI. Yeah, this XOM at, ooh, XOM is taking a little bit of a hit lately. What's that about? Huh, that's weird. Yeah, XOM has gone down you know, 8% or something like that in the last couple of, uh, last week. That's weird. Anyway, so I, uh, I bought, um, what was I getting ready to say? I, uh, oh, so we're doing, we had an investment group. This is back when investment groups was a big thing in our bar. So uh, all of us, you know, just heavy beer drinkers, we all have an investment group. And I recommend we buy Boston Market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and my roommate Chris, he said, "Now nah, I think he's wanted to buy. I think it was. I think it was AOL. Frankly, if, if memory serves, I think it was AOL. And no one listened to me, thankfully. And uh, of course, if we would have listened to Chris, we would have all been rich. Um, I think Chris actually made quite a bit of money on AOL. I can't remember. But long story short, I said, "Man." And I, I, I haven't talked to Chris in a long, long time. He emailed me about three years ago. He said, hey, how's that Boston Market stock doing for you? Just goof on. But uh, it's just kind of funny, man. I say, dude, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. That's the whole thing. You just buy so that. See, this is what I'm saying. I just love dividends because dividends are cash money that you can rely on to be there. As long as you have enough, uh, of, of, as long as you have enough of different holdings not one should break the bank but when it, i tell you man when it comes to inflation growing dividends work it does now the price appreciation might not work so what happened in the 70s the dividends were growing the earnings per share was growing is the, the price appreciation was declining so basically you had two competing entities growing dividends growing earnings per share but yeah the price appreciation crashing like a freaking you know, uh, a, a supposed Saudi hijacker plane, flying a plane, you know what I'm saying? A Cessna Saudi hijacker. And, and what happened was the PE contraction more than offset the growth of earnings and the growth of dividends. And that sucked. But if you're living off the dividends, you're like, I don't care. But the problem, again, is you, is the dividends in of itself don't always grow. That's what I'm trying to say. They don't always grow. They fluctuate. They go down. Which is why you have to have a diversified enough portfolio so you're not relying on all new corn, for instance. I'm just using that for example. You have to have some holdings in cash. And now that we're getting rewarded 4.5% for cash, ah, why not do it? Dividend stocks, some bonds, some cash. I just, can you beat that? What else can you do when it comes to investing to fight inflation, to fight you know, deflation? Because remember, deflation, dividends are great, cash is great, bonds are great. Inflation. Uh, so what happens? People say, "Oh my goodness, growth stocks will do great in inflation." Really? Is that what happened in the seventies? No, it didn't. And so, like whatever the guy's name was, he said, "Dividends are a good hedge against inflation." I completely agree with that. And dividends are a great hedge against deflation as well. Now that doesn't mean the company's going to keep doing it. We don't know, but uh, you know, hopefully, they don't start freaking. You know, you don't end up with the next end. But you know, if you get a good diversified portfolio of, of quality funds uh, that have low fees or your own individual stocks, like my man had Nucor in there since 1994, um, I tell you, man. All right. I bought into an SMA all dividend stocks. When was separate, see, the problem is separately managed accounts. You're probably paying pretty heavy fees. Um, yeah, whatever. Portfolio of no more than 4% annuals, maybe money. Yeah, but every, that's, that's 100%, dude. But don't forget. Um, Everyone's made money since the 1990s. Why not use the cash from your uh, whole life policies? Well, well, you can reinvest in your whole life policies and make more dividends. I mean, whole life policies are great, great in that regard. We're talking about increasing dividends, most likely with inflation and tax free as well. Um, okay, that's uh, good companies don't cut dividends in times of crisis. Oh, boy. Great companies raise them. Oh, my goodness. And so we're back to this again. Oh, it gets so boring. And what's a good company? One that doesn't cut dividends. All right. So when it cuts dividends, it's no longer. I, no, I, that's, I, own, I own that. That's I literally just did this. I own Southern. And because I own it, it means it's too risky. So what's a good company? One that doesn't cut dividends. So if it cuts dividends next year, is that a good company? No, no more. But it was, but we didn't cut dividends, so it was a good company. Yes. So we say it's a not a good company only after the fact. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's not helpful. Great companies raise dividends while times of crisis. Okay. So it's a great company. A company that's raising dividends during times of crisis. Okay. So the next crisis comes around. We can count on it raising its dividends. Uh, we don't know. Well, I thought you said great companies raise Dividends during times of crisis. They do. So we can count on that company. Raise their dividend during times of crisis. And this is, again, we're back to the random walk. No one knows nothing about the future. Um, face purple crying? I don't get it. 
Every live he does stays purple crying. Yeah, dude. I mean, literally, I'm the guy who said buy Boston Market. 100%. I mean, we got example after example after example of this. Of this. this, this I'm just, this, is, this is a cockiness that, and I'm not trying to pick on you, living large. This is the cockiness these dividend guys have. We're just going to buy growing dividend companies that are great. I hear that all the time. It's just, it's so, it's, it's, it's the problem with the dividend investors is they, they get sold this bill of goods that says, you know, we're going to buy these good companies that uh, don't cut dividends. And we're going to buy great companies that do. And you're like, what happened with all these other stocks? Um, so, look, so here's this guy. I don't know who this guy is. So social conscious is the best. So obviously, I'm not sure there's a bot, but certainly a guy who's uh, probably a, uh, I don't want to say a fire guy, but probably new to the world of investing. And uh, it just read a couple of books or a couple of papers. And he's, you know, just using what, uh, not Jim Cramer, because he wouldn't be that silly to use Jim Cramer, but some guy, Robert Kiyosaki or something like that said. And, uh, and I agree, actually, social and conscious investing is for suck. I don't have any disagreement with that. But given the back to back of his last statement, this is kind of like, you know, verbatim straight from the anti ESG people. You know what I'm saying? Like we have these uh, clarion calls that sound so simple, and yet in reality, it doesn't work like that. Well, because your target date funds have bonds, dude. I mean, bonds. I mean, so I mean, you're up. She's up nine point one, and you're up uh, seven. We'll say six. Right? And that's the nature of the beast, dude. You know, things move, ebb and flow. If you would have said to me in 2011, you had gold fund at USA, USAGX, you would have been up 32 percent a year for the last decade. And guess what happened, man? Guess what happened? You got spanked. But during a downturn, will the dividends from consumer staple stocks be cut? I don't know, Charlie. I don't know. Also, that's that. No one knows. I mean, could they? Sure. Will they all be cut? I doubt it. But you know, the, the, I'm, I'm like the Great Depression survivor. I remember 2008 like it was yesterday. I remember 2001, zero, one, and two like it was yesterday. And I remember all the stuff that we were told before that all turned out to be a bill of goods. No one knows nothing. You know, well, I'm going to diversify portfolio. Everything correlated in 2008, except for government bonds. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we want growth stocks because they can go to the moon. And we all kind of knew. We all, I didn't have any growth stocks. I mean, I was playing around with some, selling some options and stuff, but I didn't have anything for the long term. We all kind of knew the PE ratios are too high. You know, we, everybody knew this on growth stocks. It was only a matter of when. But the fear of missing out was tough, dude. I mean, literally from 1995 to 1999, literally Q1 of 2000. You know, the, the growth stocks are freaking going like 35% clip. It's tough to freaking miss out on that. It's tough to miss out on that. You're, they're growing at a 35% clip, and your dividend-oriented stocks are going at 12. I, look, I, I remember this like it was yesterday. You know, you see these guys freaking getting bank in Amazon, not Amazon, maybe Amazon, but the, the tech companies at the time. You're like, dude, I'm not getting bank. And people are like, oh, you know, you said the new economy. The Dow thirty six thousand or whatever that guy said, James uh, James Freeman. I forgot. I know that guy actually. I met him a couple of times. I like him. The guy who wrote Dow thirty six thousand or Dow three thousand thirty thousand. His premise was faulty. It was based on equity risk premium, which I don't want to get into too much here. But the idea is that bonds average four percent, stocks average six or average ten percent. Thus, there's a six percent equity risk premium. So you basically take the equity risk premium over uh, what from historic numbers 6% really bonds over stocks over bonds uh, you, you add that to the current 10 year treasury yield and that's your rate of return on stocks it's freaking stupid but that's what people fall. I and mean, there's all these different things that people fall for this man it's it's boring actually it's just it's so it's like oh i've heard it all I've heard it all oh my goodness we're going to take an equity risk premium Historically, stocks have averaged six percent over bonds. Bonds are paying two, so we should expect eight percent rate of return on stocks because of six percent ERP. You're like, oh, it's it just the same thing. We, you know, diversified portfolio. We have small growth, large growth, small value, large value, international. Uh, you know, blah blah blah, and uh, everything is everything is correlated when the markets go south. And then we thought, well, government bonds will be the thing that doesn't correlate when the markets go south. 
because that's what happened in 2007, 8, 9. And then 2022, that's not what happened. It's, this is where you can't be cocking this stuff. That's why you got to have some cash. And now you're being rewarded for cash because everyone thinks they know until the next bear market. says, so, oh, we didn't see that coming. Dude, who is predicting a bear market in government bonds in 2021? No one. No one. And yet we had the biggest bear market ever in government bonds, ever. No one walking the face of the earth has ever seen it so bad. No one. And who was predicting that? Nobody. Oh, people said the dollar is going to crash, blah, 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 blah. Hey, the dollar didn't crash. As the interest rates went up so fast, so far, so furious that the bonds got smoked. And there was no reprieve in 2022. None. No Bitcoin. Nothing gave the reprieve from the correlation. But I have non-correlated assets, maybe gold, maybe gold and silver, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's just these are the lessons you learn. And they started realizing you see these diatribes about, you know, great companies have increased their dividends during times of crisis. It's like, oh, it's just written out of a freaking, you know, rookie league's investment guide on YouTube. Like, oh, so boring. Um, Are there any stocks you're watching to buy on a sale if crash happens? If so, on the drop or if it all starts rising? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know, uh, caboose, cabulous. Um, I don't really pay that much attention, frankly. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to. I'm. I'm just trying to get by. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I don't know anything about good online banks. I don't know. I mean, I just like my credit union in the USA. I mean, I, I like if. If things go south, I'm sitting on a bunch of cash. I'm definitely going to be loading up on dividend stocks. That's a fact. You know what I'm saying? But uh, the question is, will I be able to sit on a bunch of cash until then? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm self-employed. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. When you're self-employed, you got, yeah, Navy Fed. out. Yeah, Navy Fed is my bank. When you're self you don't know when your next paycheck's coming. You know what I'm saying? So you got to keep a pretty significant cash exposure. Um, you know, in, in a, a growing economy, you know, growing economy lifts all boats. Uh, contracting economy sinks all boats. Um, that's a fact. And so, so for me, as I'm sitting here now, I'm just trying to get by, dude. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I got investments. I got a bunch of cash. I like that. And, you know, if, if things go south pretty heavily, I'll be loading up on stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I, I go in, like somebody said here, yeah, dollar cost average. You know, every now and again, I'll buy, pick up 100 shares of this, you know, and, uh, you know, I probably buy some more EDV. I didn't do it on Monday like I thought I was gonna, but uh, I do like that. And you know, I buy some uh, Costco probably because I I go to Costco once a week. And I spend a boatload of money there. I'm not gonna buy an odd uh, not buy, I'll buy an odd lot because I can't afford uh, 100 shares of Costco is trading at 400 bucks a pop. But uh, you know, that's you know that's that's my growth oriented stock, and I you typically shy away from growth oriented stocks, but I frequent Costco a lot. And uh, I like it. It's a good company. You know, they're run by Libs, but I think they do right, and I and I like it. So I'm uh, hey, we got a guy from India, right on, man. India in the house, trading his rupees. Is Costco down a lot? No, oh, for real. Fifty-two week high was five sixty-four. Fifty-two week low was four hundred six. It's at four ninety-six now. So it's uh, yeah, it's come back. Woo! It got smoked and uh, wow, it went from five forty in December, November thirtieth to freaking four fifty. Yeah, and they pay a tiny dividend. And the PE's on the high side. I just, uh, that would be my only growth stock. That would be my only growth stock, man, would be Costco. Because um, I like dividend stocks. All right, I'm going to land this plane. God bless, guys. Appreciate y'all being here. Good conversation, man. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Caboose. Yeah, no, look, look, my man Mike having a lot of good stuff here. Mike, if I was pissing on you a little bit, my apologies. Um, I didn't mean to. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm not trying to be a dick. You got a lot of comments in there, so I thought you were trying to over, you know, take over the, the commenting, but it looks like you did not. So I just saw a bunch of comments from Mike back to back to back. So, oh boy, here we got another guy trying to take over the comments, but it looks like he's he's okay. So he's all right. 
yeah, Costco. I like Costco, dude. One hundred percent, man. One hundred percent. All right, I'm getting tired, man. We're gonna get out of here. All right, God bless. We'll see you guys.